You're listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast, episode 89, brought to you by Vessi Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. Uh, well, folks, today we've got uh, author Robert Pavlis, author, teacher, and master gardener. He's the author of the books uh, Garden Myths, uh, Garden Myths 1, Garden Myths 2, and Building Natural Ponds. He lives in southern Ontario, Canada, where he maintains uh, Aspen Grove Garden, which is a five-acre botanical garden and teaches at a local university there from time to time. Uh, last year, we did a show called Things You Don't Need to Buy, or Things, Things You Shouldn't Buy, I think was the title. And today, we're going to do another episode along those lines called More Things You Shouldn't Buy. So in the previous episode, we talked about uh, bone meal, uh, vitamin B1, landscaping fabric, mycorrhizal fungi as an additive, uh, rock dust, and uh, using certain kinds of hand tools. And today we're going to talk about some other things. Robert, how are you doing? Hey, I'm great. Thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> That's great. And uh, what kind of a, I mean, I haven't talked to you for a while now, since the spring, before the spring, in fact. Um, how has things been uh, this, like, what, what kind of summer did you have in terms of a growing season? Well, we probably had the weirdest summer we've ever had. It was <laughs> extremely cold and wet all spring, and uh, everything was behind. A lot of plants are blooming at the wrong time. Um, now it's really dry, so I don't know. Uh, <laughs> veg vegetable, I still don't have tomatoes. Uh, I don't have tomatoes either. I mean, I, I mean they're, I, they're I, green, I, you know. But. Yeah, I have green tomatoes. I just uh, have red ones now. My rule of thumb is that if I get them for August 1st, I've done a good job with my tomatoes. Right. And I think the first ones ripened about four days ago. <laughs> I had, uh, there was one year where I planted a variety of tomato that takes like 120 days of a brandy wine or something like that. And uh, I didn't, basically I had to pick them all uh, the day before it frost. So I decided to, to make them all into uh, tomato chow, green tomato chow. And when you make green tomato chow, you, 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 you slice them all up and you put them in a big thing with salt. You brine them overnight. And the next morning I was busy and I didn't have time to deal with them. So I put, I had this big stainless steel thing with all the tomatoes and I put it aside. And then the next day, um, I needed the counter space. So I put it on the ground and I left it there for a week. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, so all of that ended up being nothing. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it's a similar, it's been, uh, on, you know, it, it's rare that we get a dry summer here, but if you look at my lawn, I followed your advice, basically not, I haven't done anything with my lawn at all this summer. I haven't even stopped. I stopped mowing it because there's nothing, it hasn't grown. It just went, at some point, early August, it just went dormant and a lot of the grass looks dead and uh, it doesn't look the best, but I haven't had to mow it all summer. Um, there's one patch where the uh, septic field is, which is green and lush and high. Um, but other than that, it just looks like a, a wasteland sort of thing. That's to give people an indication of how um, dry it's been. You know, they they see my garden where everything's mulched, and I I watered my garden once all summer long. Other than that, the mulch has handled, um, you know, maintaining the moisture levels in the soil. The garden looks really good. Um, but so people think, well, you're living in Nova Scotia, you're getting rain every day, and we do get a, a mist overnight. But yeah. what, whatever we've had has not been enough to maintain a lawn. The lawn's dead, right? So the lawn well, is not dead. dead. The, the no, no. <laughs> it's dorm, yeah, it's dormant. It's, it's basically waiting for the, the rain season sort of thing. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's the dry season now. But yeah, to give an indication of, you know, if it rained all the time, the lawn would be green and I'd have to mow it all summer long. It's just, just stopped growing and went dead or dormant, um, you know, <laughs> well over a month ago. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's been challenging here in certain regards. In other regards, it was, we had a nothing spring, like a, a cold, useless, no sun spring, just overcast. And uh, and then July 1st, it was 30. Yeah. 30 for like two weeks straight, and it was hot all July, and everything grew like uh, right out of the gates. Everything just started growing. It was like a proliferation of growth. Everything grew like crazy, and it stayed like that right up until just this last week. This morning, I think it was 10C outside this morning it was cold uh, yeah. like you know much cooler than it had been uh, for the last few days so it's yeah it's definitely been a weird weird year and i'm going to anticipate we're going to get more weird years as time goes on yeah it's it might be i hope it's not like this again though <laughs> when i think of a plate like where you live like variable um variable undependable climate is 
almost a characteristic of the Maritimes, right? Because there's so many different um, maritime uh, Atlantic systems that affect, you know, if the wind comes off the mainland, we get this. If it comes up into the south, we get that. If it comes down in the north, it gets that. If, if there's a hurricane, it does this other thing. And I lived for six years in Hamilton, Ontario, which isn't too far from you. And uh, my impression of Ontario, southern Ontario anyway, was stable, predictable temperatures. Probably why it's such a good, uh, you know, historically such a good, you know, good things grow in Ontario, uh, sort of an agricultural built. Uh, state, you know, when you as a student here in Nova Scotia, when you uh, I used to have, you know, I, I went lived in one place and went went to university somewhere else, and a certain time in in the fall, for instance, when you leave the house, you have to bring a rain jacket. I don't care what day it is, or or, or an umbrella, right? And you probably want to bring like a sweater. You know, like you have to bring all these different options, and it doesn't really matter what the weatherman says; it could be anything. And what I loved about living in southern Ontario is, is if it was a cold fall day, uh, I could go outside with a wool sweater on. I didn't have to bring a rain jacket or boots. Like if, if, if I woke up and it wasn't raining, it probably wasn't going to rain, just this, that consistency. So it must be a real challenge for um, a year like this where things have not been as predictable. Yeah, yeah Ontario's pretty steady. I mean, we have... Springs are quite nice. Uh, summers are always really hot and dry, so the yeah. six weeks without rain wasn't that unusual. Right. Um, but the spring was really weird. Like it just just never got warm and rained a lot. Right. And we we never have that kind of weather. So well, there's always next year, you know. There's always next year. You never know. <laughs> uh, so today we're going to talk about. Uh, I'll just list the topics. Fish fertilizer, seaweed extract, uh, soil pH, uh, a soil pH tester, a kit, uh, blossom and rot spray, uh, ladybugs, and biochar. Uh, so I guess let's just get started. Fish fertilizer. What are your thoughts fish on fertilizer. fish fertilizer? Well, I have I have several thoughts about it. First of all, there's there's nothing really wrong with fish fertilizer. The problem is that a lot of people who use it think that it has some sort of miracle properties. Right. And it really doesn't. It's, it's no better or worse than other kinds of fertilizer. Um, yeah. It is good. Uh, nothing wrong with that. My one problem with it is that a lot of the big name fish fertilizers are actually made with fish that are specifically caught to make fertilizer. Oh, it's not like leftover junk. Well, you see, I was always the impression that with, with a big fish industry, uh, there's got to be a lot of, you know, fish leftovers, the heads and the guts and so on, and they make fertilizer out of it. Yeah, that that's sounds right. really great, right? <laughs> well, it turns out that most of the large manufacturers don't use that material. They actually use fish that they harvest from the ocean. It's a fish that's small and, and we it's really not an edible fish, but other fish in the ocean are eating it. So it's perfectly it's edible if you're a, a bigger fish than that. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So we go out and, and we call these junk fish and we, we harvest them by the boatloads, bring them to shore, process them. Now, admittedly, most of those go into pet fertile, or, or pet food, but a certain amount gets used for making fertilizer. And that just doesn't make any sense to me. Oh. You know, we're harming the environment bringing this stuff in, processing it, shipping it around the country, and then claiming some magical properties for it. Yes. And so I, I, I don't like it from that perspective. Oh. Now, some of the products are made with fish we don't want. So they're collecting carp from the Mississippi, for instance. And in right. Australia, they have a similar problem. They have a local fish that's invading rivers, and they're collecting that. And if someone's making fish fertilizer from that, no problem. Or if they're using, you know, fish leftovers from the, the fishing industry, that's fine too. Um, so if you can get fish fertilizer uh, and, and it's, it's, you know, being, you, being made from leftover material, uh, that's great. But it's actually one of the most expensive sources of nitrogen. So on my blog, I, I calculate actually the cost per nitrogen for fish fertilizer. And it's it's just ridiculous prices. You can go out and buy any kind of fertilizer for nitrogen is much cheaper. Right. And nitrogen is the nutrient that most people need in the garden. So that's really right. what you're paying for is the nitrogen. 
Right. So from that perspective, it doesn't really make a lot of sense unless you have a local source for it. I think there's a, an incredible, I mean, I, th I think I even talked about this in our lad, uh, last pa uh, uh, podcast that there is a, uh, there's an impulse among gardeners. I mean, everybody wants to have a good garden. And if, if anyone can convince them that there's some uh, magic juice <laughs> with magical powers, that's, I mean, I honestly think that if, if you took a one gallon watering can and you peed in it and filled it up with water and put that on your plants, it would probably equal or outperform, at least equal just about everything on the market because you've got all those minerals in there. I mean, very few people could get past the idea of doing something like that, but I don't see how ground up rotten fish is much different than, uh, you know, that sort of thing. I, I you, know, you know what I mean? Like in terms of what's, you know, yeah, I just, uh, you know. Urine I, is actually a really good source of nitrogen. Yeah. And it's just, and, and most of the world uses it, right? It's, it's just developed countries who don't want to use feces and urine in their garden. But yeah, we'd, we'd rather... The majority just, of the world uses it. No, we just, yeah. we'd rather kill millions of fish. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we, exactly. No, and that's the thing, the thing, I'm, I'm an avid angler, and, and you're taking all the food out of that system. So, I mean, yeah, the, all those things, that, the, you know, the ocean is a, a chain of predators. Everything yeah. kills everything. So if you take something at the bottom out, then something above it's going to be missing something. Um, yeah. you know, yeah. um, not to mention all the fuel, like the incredible ecological footprint of, of catching it, moving yeah. it around, processing it, da, 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 da. you know, whereas, uh, or even if you, if you didn't like you know, peeing in a bucket, but I've done experiments where you just take like uh, grass clippings and throw it in a bucket and fill it up with water and wait a few days and I don't know what's in there, but you can tell by the smell. There's something going on in there, you know, like it smells like sewer, basically. But you're, you've created something. There's there's some there's definitely nutrients in that water. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it takes a little bit of a uh, little bit of elbow grease and that sort of thing. But uh, it's really not that difficult to make your own various kinds of uh, tea, you know, compost tea sorts of things. Or just take those grass clippings and spread them around the soil and let nature do it all for you. That's which is what I do. <laughs> and that them, works just as well. Move the middleman, exactly. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, along those same lines, seaweed extract. Seaweed extract. So, again, this is uh, one of these products that has mythical properties that really don't exist. There's no evidence that seaweed extract does anything for plants other than provide some nutrients. So, seaweed is really just another plant product. It's a plant. It, it grows really fast. And so uh, you, you think, okay, we're, we're making lots of it in the, in the ocean. We don't really eat most of it. Uh, we, we can harvest it and use it on our, on our gardens. And s the problem is that it depends on where that seaweed comes from. So some seaweed is actually collected from wild areas. And as you decrease the amount of seaweed in the ocean, you are also harming all kinds of critters in the ocean. And so we don't want to do that. If you're collecting it from a beach and it's the stuff that you know, floats up on the surf, great, collect that and put it in your garden. Uh, it turns out that there are seaweed farms down around the coast around California where they actually harvest it just like a crop. Hmm. So they have it growing and they go out and I don't know the details, but they, you know, they take a couple of feet off every few days and then it grows back and they actually maintain those forests of seaweed. And that's the material that's actually used for most of the commercial seaweed extract. Really? So from an environmental point of view, it's a renewable resource, right? And there's really nothing wrong with using it. And as a fertilizer, it, it does add nutrients for your plants. But again, there's no evidence that it's any better than any other kind of organic material. Yeah, I mean, what would it, what would it, what would it have? What, what nutrients would it be gathering in its material that would be different from leaves from a tree or grass? Or, you know, there might be a bit of iodine. I don't know how much iodine you need in a garden. Uh, you know. <laughs> well, one of the uh, arguments that people make is that the ocean has something like 60 different uh, elements in it. And seaweed 
probably has a lot of those inside. Same with fish. So they have all these different nutrients. The problem is plants only use about 21 of them. Right, right. And the other half aren't being used. Right. And so a lot of people are promoting the fact that, uh, you know, my product has really high nutrient levels and has all these various types of nutrients. In fact, I've seen one product selling uh, um, uh, sea salt, and it has like 96 different minerals and nutrients in it. Well, that's great, but plants only use 21. <laughs> so you can supply all the extra things you want, but it's not going to make any difference to a plant. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so in, in theory, I guess seaweed could have something in there, some chemical that land plants don't have, because I'm sure their biology is a little different. But we haven't figured out what that is yet. So at this point, as far as we know, there, there's nothing in seaweed that you can't get from grass clippings. I mean, I, I gather it from the shore from time to time. When I had a pickup truck, I used to gather a lot more. Um, there was a beach here. Just you know, after a really good storm, it's usually really up. High. It's usually up nice and high above the tide line, and there's a good rain, so it's sort of been rinsed a little bit. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm basically, if it wasn't free, and I, I've told people, people ask me like, "Oh, I'm using extract. I'm doing this," and I, I said, "Why are you buying it? Like, I'm not using it because I think it's the best thing. I'm using it because it's free." It's free. Um, and uh, a side benefit I've always thought is, is is when you're just getting it washed up dead on the beach like that, you're not just getting seaweed. There's all kinds of dead things in there, like there's dead little, tiny little different kinds of sea life. You know, normally, too, it's teeming with these things called they're, – they're like little – they call them – there's a fancy name for them. Uh, people call them sandhoppers, the little mm. uh, sort of teeny tiny shrimp-like things. And, uh, you know, you – they base they all die. <laughs> they can't live. <laughs> you might have a bunch in the trunk of your car or whatever. You got to sort of put a garbage bag over it. I got a whole bunch of them in the garage one year. I, I brought in, what was it now? I gathered a whole bunch of seaweed and I was walking on the beach on, on this giant pile of seaweed. And all of these uh, sand hoppers were in the soles of my boots. <laughs> and so I put, you know, I put my boots inside the garage and the next morning, my one of my, my kids went down to get their shoes on for school, and, and she was screaming. And my wife went down, and she was screaming. There's all these weird insects uh, all over the place in the garage. And they were in my, I guess the, the environment was just right in the garage. I and mean, they, they had nothing to eat. I said, they're going to die. There's nothing for them. And they're, they're marine life. But these things were in my garage for about two months. Uh, every, time, every time you pick something up, they'd be under it. Like, you know, so I, I had to just basically sort of scour the grab, but there's no way they were living there because there's no, these things, they, they live in the, underneath the seaweed. And if it gets hot, they go down into the sand, right? They, they have a certain temperature they want to be at and they, and they, they need the tide to come in and out. So uh, anyway, I'm getting way off topic. The point is that when I spread that over my soil, I was also spreading thousands of those things yeah. And, you know, they would basically like little teeny tiny shrimp. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going into the soil. Um, but but anyway, the whole point is that I wouldn't buy that. I would never buy that when I could just right. throw leaves or grass or wh whatever you can get your hands. And people often ask me, what do you use, hay or, or straw? And it's like, well, from your soil's point of view, it's the same thing. It's, it's <laughs> just, you know, if anything, because people have this thing against hay because it's got weed seeds in it. But because this hay has the seeds in it, the seeds are actually the uh, the greater energy source in a sense, right? And if yeah. you can get the seeds in a situation where they break down and rot, you're actually putting more sort of energy matter into the soil in a sense. Um, so conceivably, there's more nutrients in the hay. Hay has, has a higher nutrient level. Yeah, that's what the animals eat. I mean, the cows are eating hay sort of thing. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think what I've been told recently is that uh, it may have more seed in it, but it's it's the hay seed and not weed seed, right? Because it's collected earlier in the season before a lot of weeds have gone to seed. I can or say that straw I, has more weed seeds in it, uh, depending on how it's collected. I can say that hay has a, uh, it's got every kind of seed in it. <laughs> I mean, it depends on what they're growing, right? But I mean, I mean, I've got three things in all of my gardens. I have vetch, I have not three things. I got sorrel, vetch, grass, you know, hay, and um, and clover. 
and other things like, you know, just cause I'm always putting hay on and, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things and it's just, cause it's just a while. I mean, maybe it depends on where you're getting it from here, but, but I mean, here in, in Nova Scotia, I mean, they just, they just mow down the meadow and bale it up. So there's God knows what in there. Right. But, mm -hmm. you know, anyway, the, the point is, is that as, as long as you keep it on, you don't get too many weeds anyway. Your, your hay results in weeds when, when you don't replenish the mulch layer and it gets thin. And then yeah. the heat, the soil can heat up, and all of a sudden you've got a lawn. Uh, your yeah. garden becomes a lawn. Uh, if you can keep it on there, uh, I, I'll see the difference because when I plant potatoes, um, I plant the potatoes and I put like maybe eight to a, eight inches to a foot inch of hay over the potatoes, and there's no weeds. Yeah. And then in a garden where I plant carrots, I move the soil, I move the mulch aside to plant the carrots, and of course there's all kinds of different weeds coming up in amongst the carrots because there's zillions of weed seeds in the soil. But, uh, anyway, getting off topic here. <laughs> um, the soil, I, I got some definite questions. Do you have any more to talk about that? No, that's good. Oh, sorry, I'm talking too much. Um, the soil pH tester, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, my first thought is, is people should really ask themselves why they're measuring the pH in the first place. Okay. So a lot of people want to know the pHs of their soil, which is, which is good. But then my question always is, okay, now that you know the pH, what are you actually going to do about it? Right. The advice for most people and, and the advice I give the people is leave it alone. Don't do anything with it. Right. Uh, you don't want to get into, to, to the point where you're constantly adjust, trying to adjust pH. Right. And unless you have really extreme pHs, whatever you have is probably going to work for most can you, things. Can you talk a little bit about that whole stabilization capacity of soil? That's a good thing you have in your book. So the sort of the, the buffering capacity. Buff, that's what I meant to say, of, buffering. Of yeah. Soil, yeah. So um, it really depends on what your soil is to start with. But uh, for instance, in my soil, I'm alkaline and I have a lot of calcium and limestone in the soil. Yeah. So if I put some acid on there, it, it doesn't last very long because the acid reacts with the limestone and the limestone neutralizes it. Mm -hmm. And what I tell people around here is, is a acid, uh, just regular clean rain, forget about pollution, just clean rain. When it comes through the air, it picks up CO2, makes carbonic acid, and by the time it hits the earth, it has a pH of about 5.5, which is fairly acidic. Mm -hmm. And that's been uh, falling here for, you know, I don't know how many millions of years. Right. And our soil is still alkaline. <laughs> so what kind of effect do you think, you know, putting a bit of vinegar on your soil or some pine needles or, or some acidic fertilizer or whatever, all these little things, salt, it's going to have like zero effect on the, the pH. Right. Uh, sulfur does change the pH, but just short term. So if you start putting sulfur in to lower the pH, you got to put it on every year. Right. It's a continual process because it gets used up. The sulfur will slowly react. It gets neutralized by the limestone, and we're back to an alkaline soil. Right. And that's going to happen until all the limestone in our soil is gone. So you'd need a truckload or a dump truck or whatever, a foot high or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the other thing is that organic matter works very well as a buffer, too. Mm -hmm. So as long as you keep your organic matter up, uh, you're going to buffer whatever you put in. Right. The other thing that is very rarely discussed is the pH of the soil and the pH around roots can be very different. So plant roots have a, a layer around them, a very thin layer that they condition. Uh, and it's called the, the rhizosphere. Okay. The rhizosphere is this little layer of about a couple millimeters around the actual root and the plant uh, ex, ex, excretes chemicals into that to condition the pH. Really? So the pH at the root can easily be a pH or two units different than the rest of the soil. Really? Yeah, really. And, and oh. that pH conditions the nutrients that it, it is able to pull out of the soil too. Yes. So the rhizosphere actually is a really interesting thing that most gardeners have no idea even exists. Almost like a force field. 
<laughs> it's it's kind of like a force field. It's also the place that most of the microbes live. So most of the bacteria and the fungi and so on, we, we talk about them being in the soil and being important. But in fact, the largest population of those is in this rhizosphere layer. Mm. And the reason it's there is that plants actually exude chemicals to attract them. I see. So it's actually attracting the right microbes it wants around itself all those microbes are are eating and sleeping and dying and and digesting the soil and and doing things for the plants and conditioning the ph that's fascinating so the ph that we measure actually doesn't tell us what the ph is at where the roots are so hmm. that's another problem uh, i mean ph testers are are fine um most of the electronic ones aren't very good. So the other thing people don't understand about pH is that it's a, a log scale. Okay, so we talk about a pH of seven and a pH of six, and and we think, oh, that's only a one number difference. Yes. But it's on a log scale. So yes. a difference between six and a seven is actually a difference of ten. Right. Okay. So if your listeners aren't mathematicians kind of ignore that, but just understand that the, each pH unit is actually a big jump. Right. And uh, on most of these meters that you buy, you can only get whole numbers. And whole mm -hmm. numbers are pretty much useless for adjusting your soil. Okay? Right. You can find out it's a 6 or it's a 7, but that's not close enough to adjust. You really need at least one decimal point to be of any value. I see. Okay, so if you take your reading and you get a, a reading and it's an approximate reading because the, the instrument's not very accurate, now you want to go and change your pH. Well, to know how much to put in, you have to have a more accurate number. So right. you, now you're kind of stuck, right? So what does a person do? Well, he throws a handful of stuff on the soil and hopes it changes. Well, what was the point of measuring it in the first place then, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, so if you want an accurate pH, uh, the best thing to do is send it to a lab and, and they'll measure it properly. Uh, there are some little, uh, what, what people tend to call litmus paper, but that's a completely wrong term. Litmus paper is useless for, for measuring soil. But there are some test strips that have several color spots on it. Right. And if you get one with at least three color spots and the range is the soil range, so it's a pH of... Uh, let's say five to seven or so would be good. Uh, you can get a fairly good value. Hmm. But there's another way to do this, which I think is even better. What's that? Find yourself a gardener in your community and ask him a couple questions. Do you grow blueberries and do you grow rhododendrons or azaleas? And if the person says, no, they don't grow here, then your soil is not acidic. Right, right. <laughs> um, so I can't grow those here. Nobody in this town does. Now, nurseries really? keep selling them, and people keep trying to grow them, oh. and everyone's very disappointed, but we just can't grow those things. We're too alkaline. Wow. So if you, if you have a gardening friend, they probably know what the pH is approximately. Right. And once you have an approximate pH, you know, you're either going to be sort of neutral or alkaline, or you're going to be very acidic. And yeah, like the soil that, tends to be acidic in this part of the world. Yeah, so. you're, the, the Maritimes typically are acidic, right? No, that's strange because I, was, I got off topic talking to, I had a guy from a university extension and we got off topic and we were talking about potato scab. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, you know, um, alkaline soils or even soils that are neutral tend to um, be conducive to potato scab. Yeah. And I said, oh, well, that's interesting because... Not only in my prepared beds, but I, I, like this is a perfect year. This year, I, I I literally broke soil in the meadow next to my garden. So this is never gardened in before, you know, because this was a forest. This was never a farm. This was just a forest. Um, so I broke that soil and I put some potatoes in it, and they have scab. And I did the same thing last year. I just I didn't believe it. So the soil here, um, and that was with um, uh, seed provider, you know, seed grade seed potatoes, right? From Vessi's yeah. seeds, they're, 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 they wouldn't give you something that would have that on it sort of thing, right? So I got clean seeds and virgin soil, and I got the scab. And so how on earth could the soil here where I live 
uh, possibly be anything other than acidic, but it, it's either that or there's just some some reason that the scab, uh, or is it a bacteria? I think it's a bacteria, um, naturally exists in the soil here. Um, you know. Uh, well, the the fact that you, if you have acidic soil, doesn't mean you won't get it. It's mm. just less likely to less get likely, it. Less yes, likely, yes. And if you right. do get it, it's less severe. Right. Than than in alkaline soil. I guess it could but have been worse. It, it doesn't. I, yeah, I, I can't remember if it's a fungi or a bacteria, but it tends yeah. not to grow as well in acidic soil. Yeah. So you tend to have less of it and less of a problem. Yeah. I was going to ask you because in and you know a lot of people that garden the way I do the no no tail approach, they don't have like the way I was brought up to garden. You, your garden is this big rectangle and, and you 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 um, rototill the whole thing. And then you just make rows. So basically all the soil in the garden is commingled and mixed together. But a lot of no-till gardeners like myself, they have beds and walking paths. So the paths are paths and the beds are beds. And every one of my, like people have asked me, I've never done a soil test here. Basically if everything's growing and I just assume everything's okay. If, if I noticed, uh, if I noticed a, a bed doing really poorly, I come up with a theory why it's doing poorly and I plant something in there, I think it'll do well. So if something's like, I think maybe it's acidic, I'll plant potatoes there. And if, if things are doing poorly, I might plant uh, beans there because they don't need as much nitrogen, that sort of stuff, right? Um, and just see how things, you know, move things around from year to year. But the point is, is that the reason I've never done a soil test is because each bed, um, some of the beds were made with the existing soil. Uh, some of the beds, uh, you know, I, 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 I put a, you know, box down and filled it up with horse manure. And then every and each bed is being mulched with different things. One bed might get a, you know, six inches of seaweed in the fall. I do almost my mulching in the fall when I'm sort of putting the garden down. A lot of them get leaves, but in any given year, it could be this type of leaf or that kind of leaf, or it could be a lot of pine needles. It could be anything, right? Um, just basically whatever people bag up and throw on the on the sidewalk is my mulch. Sometimes it's grass, you know. Sometimes it's uh, just anything, basically whatever I can get. So I've never. I would have to do a soil test in every single one of these beds to get a sense. I mean, if I do a soil test of the existing soil that was underneath everything, I would get a sense of what I was starting with. But every bed has been so, you know, every year I'm putting bags and bags and bags of different kinds of organic matter on there. I, I would have to think every every bed has got its own unique level. Um, uh, and I, I have a lot of beds. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. So now, now you're talking about testing for nutrients, and that is one of the problems. And if your garden's different in different areas, you really have to test each area. Yeah. And again, my philosophy for for soil testing is a little different than most people. For instance, I'm a master gardener. One of the things we tell everybody is go get a soil test done. Yes. So at one of the Master Gardener meetings, I asked everyone, I said, have How you ever got a soil test done? <laughs> it wasn't one person in the room that had ever done it. <laughs> so my philosophy of soil testing is a little like, like yours. I, I grow stuff. Yeah, put stuff so in the ground. See what happens. And if it grows, you don't need a soil test. Yes. Right? Um, most soil could use more organic material. Yeah. Particularly when you're starting out a, a new garden, yeah. so put some of that in. Organic matter is going to give you nutrients, right? Yeah. It gives you every, the whole range of nutrients. Yeah. The one nutrient that gardens may be short of is nitrogen, because nitrogen leaves the soil very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it goes into the air, and some of it uh, washes deep into the soil. So water moves nitrogen very quickly compared to all the other nutrients. So if there's a shortage, it's probably nitrogen. But right. guess what? Soil tests don't measure nitrogen. Uh. <laughs> so if you send your sample in to, for testing, uh, they can do nitrogen, but only as a special request, and they generally don't do it for gardeners. And the reason is that by the time you get your results back, your nitrogen level has changed too much. So that the value is kind of useless, yeah. Wow. In fact, what farmers do is they'll take a soil sample and they'll freeze it. Oh. Take it to the lab frozen, then they analyze it in a fro like they keep it frozen until they're ready to analyze it and get a result. Oh. But if you just put it in a bag, and, you know, drive it down there, let it sit in the back seat for a couple of days or whatever, it's useless, right? Because oh, so nobody does nitrogen, huh. and yet that's the nutrient everybody needs to know. 
It's funny you say that it, it gets washed down. I mean, this is, I mean, this, you could tell me what you think of this. There's something I have observed that um, my kale, I, mean, I, I have two beds of kale every year. And uh, usually uh, I don't really have much mulch in it until it's a certain height, right? And so, at some point in the summer, like July, I'll use grass clippings. That's all I've got. No one's putting leaves out. So I'll mow my lawn and take the, some of the grass clippings. So on my kale bed, I'll put maybe two inches of grass clippings in between all the, the kale plants. And I have noticed that the next few weeks, you know, after about a week or so, that kale starts growing like crazy. Like it outgrows everything. And I mean, and, and, you, and the, I mean, it goes, the, the soil goes on green, but you know, it, it, you can tell like if you go out the next day and it's sunny, it's really hot underneath the soil. So the nitrogen's working. Um, but then maybe a good rain takes a bunch of that down and gets it into the roots of the plants. It's almost like putting a fertilizer on the garden. Um, and well, uh, I didn't go ahead. Grass clippings are, are very high in nitrogen. Yeah. And, and that's what you're doing. You're basically putting nitrogen on. So what it probably is showing you is that if you put nitrogen on a little more often, the kale might even grow better. If I kept hitting grass to everything, because yeah. For most crops, nitrogen is the limiting nutrient. That's what's going to control how big and lush those those plants are growing. Yes. Uh, the other nutrients are almost always uh, in good supply, so you don't have to worry about it. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, all right. Um, blossom yeah, blossom. Enrot. Oh, Blossom Enrot Spray. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know how many people actually use that, but... We'll talk a little bit about blossom end rot. So blossom end rot, uh, it, it gets a black spot at the end of the tomato. And people have always said that's due to a lack of calcium. And that's sort of true, but not entirely. It's a lack of calcium in the tomato itself, in the fruit. It doesn't mean there's a lack of calcium in the soil. Mm -hmm. And calcium is one of these nutrients that plants move around in, in kind of a strange way. And the plant controls where the calcium goes. And in certain conditions, the plant says, look, I, I only have so much calcium, and I'm going to send it up to the growing tip of my plant rather than to my fruit. Mm. And so the fruit doesn't get enough. It's not that there isn't enough calcium in the soil, it's just the plant's putting it in the wrong direction. It's got other priorities at that point in time. Yeah. And the one thing that has the most effect on that is water. So when a tomato plant gets, and peppers are the same thing, when they get irregular watering cycles, so they go kind of dry, then they get really wet, and then kind of go dry, that tends to make more blossom end rot. Mm. The other thing people find is that the first tomatoes of the season tend to have blossom end rot. And I guess that every to, year. It seems every to cure year. itself. Yep. And again, that has to do with the moisture levels, I think, throughout the year and maybe some temperature involved. But the, the bottom line is it has nothing to do really with calcium. Now, if your soil doesn't have enough calcium, then, then adding some will, will help this problem. But most soil in North America has lots of calcium. It's really not an issue. That spray would be an ideal thing to sell because, like, you know, I tend to get the first ones that come, I have that. I just, you know, as soon as I notice it, I rip them off, throw them in the woods, and then they're fine. But if I rip them off and threw them in the woods and sprayed that stuff on, I would, you know, like a lot of people say, hey, I don't have, that, 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 that was the cause of the solution. They, they would attribute it to the product and not just the fact that those first ones formed when there wasn't enough calcium for them. And now... The root system is more developed. The plant has different priorities. It can put all the calcium into the fruit, and it's right. the, the sprayed into a thing. Um, so it's an ideal thing for a snake oil salesman to sell because the the problem <laughs> the problem does go away, and it's almost like giving you something for a cold. The cold, I mean, either the, either the cold's going to go away or you're going to die. You know, like it's a virus. It's either going to kill you or you're going to live. So you take the you know whatever oregano oil or whatever, and your cold gets better, and you say, hey. The oregano oil cure. Someone's. I, I'm going to get ten flaming messages from saying yeah, this because people oregano. believe in oregano oil. But yeah. uh, I mean, your cold's going to get better, or you're done, right? So <laughs> here's the interesting thing about this spray. It contains calcium, right? right. Because that's what the plant needs. Right. The problem is, 
calcium doesn't go through the skin of a tomato. So right. a tomato doesn't absorb calcium from the outside. Some will go into the leaves of plants, but when it goes into the leaves of plants, it doesn't get shunted to the fruit. Right. So calcium spray isn't going to help with blossom end rot. Is that what that is, a calcium spray? Yeah. Well, that's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. It would be yeah. like spraying it on someone with osteoporosis and hoping that it would go away. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so the other one that I find kind of hilarious is people you say use tums when you're planting your tomato. Yeah, stick it in the ground. The plant hole. Yeah. So tums does have calcium in it. So I I sat down one day and and this is on my blog. I actually calculated how much calcium you know a farmer would put on his soil for a tomato plant, and then how many tums do you need to add that amount of calcium? And you have to put something like eighty tums in every plant hole for your tomato to make any difference. So <laughs> one tums is pretty much useless. But the, it doesn't it doesn't work anyways because most people have lots of calcium in their soil. Yeah. Right. That's so right because it's a it's a non-issue. It's a watering issue. The watering if, issue. If, in fact the best thing you can do is mulch because yes. mulch keeps that water level more constant. You don't get the highs and lows. Yeah. And you don't get blossom end rot as much. You're preaching to the choir. Uh, <laughs> I'm all about the mulch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, uh, ladybugs, Lady you know, this, this is a, you know, when you, you got an aphid problem, they say buy, go to, I don't know, I don't know where you would buy these things, but they say go buy some ladybugs and, uh, and they'll take care of your aphids and that there's a certain logic to that. But, uh, why would someone want to think twice about, uh, spending money on that solution? Well, so ladybugs, uh, the both the the ladybugs themselves and the larvae both eat aphids okay so there's some logic to it and and most myths there's some logic right, right. so the someone came up with the idea well if if we go and collect these ladybugs somewhere else and bring them to our garden they they must eat all these aphids and in theory that that kind of works the problem is that uh the ladybugs are usually collected somewhere down in california where they hibernate over the winter. And they, when ladybugs hibernate, they actually collect in huge colonies. You'll have thousands and thousands of them in a small area. So if you find one of these, it's really easy to collect them. I see. And then what they do is they store them to keep them in a state of hibernation. So then they ship them to the stores all over the place. You go to the, and buy them. They're usually in some sort of a, a fridge or something, so they're kept cold because you don't want them too active and you don't want them eating each other and so on. You bring them home and you release them. And there's two problems now. The first one is that this whole process of collecting and storing has put them in a state of hibernation. Okay. And it takes them about two weeks to come out of it. Okay. They don't eat during the first two weeks. Right. They're just sort of waking up and... And they're waking up and they're kind of flying around doing you know, their own thing. The other thing is they don't stay in your garden. They don't know that you're they're so yours. So they fly away, right? Yes, yes. So number one is they're not ready to eat. Number two, they don't stick around. So I always tell all my neighbors that ladybugs are a good thing to buy. Yes, <laughs> for them. Yes. For, well, for me. Yeah, yeah they should buy them and let them go in their garden so they come over to my garden. Yes, yes. Uh, but ladybugs don't really work. They were originally, they started using them in greenhouses. And there they work really well because a, it's an enclosed space and they release them and they're in there for a long time and, and they do a great job. But in our gardens, they're just too open. They just leave. Yeah, right? I mean, it would make sense to, you know, for your garden to be the kind of habitat that ladybugs like. And, and you know, if, if you... I guess if you have the pest there, they're going to show up just to eat them, assuming that they they out eat the pests with before the pests wreck your garden. But you know, if your garden's a place that that predators like to be, you're going to have some there. Um, well, but, this uh, this is the catch twenty two that I a lot of gardeners don't really understand is, you know, they they want to attract these predators to their garden. The way you do that is by having pests, <laughs> yes. right? You have to cultivate ladybug or sorry aphids yes you need to have lots of aphids to to attract ladybugs yes but the minute someone sees aphids they want to get rid of them kill them you know exactly so the ladybugs don't come right yeah. you you have to leave a certain level of pests in your garden to attract the predators 
right? Yes. Uh, so my philosophy with almost everything is don't do anything about it. And, and nature seems to kind of take it course right yeah. uh, you see aphids collecting and you see them all over your garden and then suddenly you see a lot of ladybugs and yeah. it, it kind of takes care of itself but, that's right yeah so so buying ladybugs is is really not a it doesn't it just doesn't work no, In theory, yeah. it's great but plus the fact that we don't know what kind of harm we're doing to the ladybug populations in California uh, these are not uh, grown on farms are actually wild collected and so we don't really know what the environmental impact down there is. Some people say that you shouldn't buy them because uh, people are selling the Asian varieties. You know, the Asian ladybugs are around in Canada now, at least in Ontario. They, they're a little more orangey and, and have different markings and they bite. Right. And, uh, but that's not true. The, the ones that are being sold are not the Asian variety. Right. Uh, the Asian variety was brought over again for greenhouses to control pests and right. in there they worked really well and then they got out in the environment and now we're finding that the Asians are much more aggressive than our native ones right. and so they're out competing with our native ladybugs which right. is an environmental problem that we have now. Our polite Canadian ladybugs are getting uh, <laughs> coming last to the dinner table. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh man that's uh yeah, no. Also, I guess there's the risk if you're bringing them in from somewhere else, there could possibly be um, parasites or various pathogens that might affect your, your native population. There's some risk of that, I suppose. Um, yeah, there's always that risk. And it, it just doesn't, it, you know, it just doesn't make sense. If it worked really well, okay, I, you know, people would do it. But uh, it's just one of these things people try and then they, they don't do it again. But it keeps popping up on social media. So people keep buying them. Right. Yeah. I, I guess related to that, this isn't our last, I got, we got one more thing here and I'm asking you this, but I didn't tell you I was going to ask you so you can tell me. But um, one thing I get, uh, people are always asking, because I have mulch in all my gardens and now I've, I've put sand pathways in and uh, people are always saying, Does, do you get ants? And then if you go to any garden center, you'll, it's a garden center, it's not a house center, it's a garden center. Okay. There'll be all these products you can buy for ants. Right. And you know, I, I've never found ants to be a problem in my, I mean, they do sort of cultivate and protect aphids to a certain extent. Um, but there's only, I mean, if an ant faces down a wasp, it's going to lose. Uh, <laughs> somewhere, right? And there's other things that ants really can't contend with. Um, but I, I've never felt any necessity. I, I've, I've actually done videos where I've shown me um, harvesting potatoes and digging in like all kinds of ant larvae and literally the potatoes are growing in an anthill. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I, I, it's, it's very possible. I'll, I will say the, the disclaimer that there may be some variety of ant that's a real problem. Um, I've probably got three different kinds of ants in my, in my garden. I've got the sort of little tiny black ones and I've got the black ones with the red middle sort of thing. And I got another kind um, that's a bit different in coloration. It's sort of a medium sized one. Um, uh, so I've got all kinds of ants, um, but I've never felt a necessity to buy anything to control them um, in, in, in my vegetable garden. I don't know about, I mean, you're more of an expert on, um, not that I'm an expert on anything, but you're more of an expert on ornamentals and that sort of thing. Is there a situation where a, a, a gardener would want to control ants in their garden? Possibly. Um, so first of all, you, you probably have more like 50 different kinds of ants. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out that the ant experts can tell very minute differences between right. ants. And in fact, even in Toronto, they're still discovering new species of ants. In Toronto? Wow. Toronto. <laughs> so there's, there's hundreds of different species, but oh. they all kind of look the same. <laughs> now, there are fire ants, which we yeah. don't have in Canada as far as I know. But in some places in the U.S., fire ants can be a real problem. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's an argument that can be made to get rid of fire ants. because They're not, they're not a problem are, for your garden. They're a problem for you, right? They're a bar problem for you, right. Yeah. So when you're working out, you wouldn't be picking potatoes in a fire ant uh, <laughs> farm, right? <No. laughs> your, your ants are kind of docile and they don't bite too much, yeah, whereas yeah. fire ants are, are a lot worse. So that's the one exception. 
The other exception is that uh, in most cases, ants are really good for soil because they, they loosen it up. As yeah. you know, that, that ant heel becomes really nice and, and has lots oh, of yeah. air in there. And, and most plant roots love it. Yeah. But if it's a small plant and it's sitting in the middle of an ant hill, or more likely the small plant started and then the ants came along and built underneath it, it can make it too dry. And it can actually dry out the root system of this, this plant. So small plants are a problem. And where, where they are definitely a problem is in rock gardens, where right. we're, we're growing nothing but small plants. Uh, and uh, a fairly small anthill can actually kill plants in a rock garden. Yeah. Um, so, so that's really the exception. They don't really harm the plants. Uh, they're great at uh, picking up all kinds of dead insects and moving it around and, and putting it in the soil and, and so the nutrients get released. So 99% of what ants do is good for the garden. But yeah. if they just happen to be under a small plant, then, then you might want to get rid of them. Why so do you think so many garden centers sell this stuff, like the ant killer? People hate ants. <laughs> okay, they don't like them on their patio. They don't like them in their patio stones. They see them in their garden, and they're worried that they're going to harm their plants. And so people buy all kinds of stuff. Um, again, ants in the house is a different story well, too. Yeah, right? no, it, that's uh, that is World we, War Three. I think we can agree on that. Right? Yes, no. But as long them. as they're outside, uh, we leave them. Again, a lot of these things. If you go to one of these garden centers, you look at the chemical section. Most of those things you don't need. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Half of them, half of them either don't work or, or aren't even good for the garden. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you don't need them. So, you know, people don't like ants. And if you go to social media and Facebook groups, people are constantly asking about how to get rid of my ants. Right, right. right. So if, if you do have to get rid of them, they, there's a very simple solution. Um, most of the small ant traps are using borax. Yeah. So what you do is you get some borax and some sugar mix it 50-50, and, and spread it around where the ants are. And they will take that into their, into their nest, and it will take about a week before you see anything happen, but slowly that, that nest will kill itself. They can't taste the difference between sugar and borax, and they eat both of them, and the borax kills them. Oh, right. Okay. And it's borax is like dirt cheap. You get it in a grocery store in the laundry section, and you get a yeah. big box for like two bucks, yeah. right? And that's enough for twenty years of gardening. What is or it? You um, that, what does it? What is its effect on your? What What is borax? What is the chemical agent in borax? It's basically just carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Really? Yeah. So it's like like sugar in it's, a sense. It's an organic compound. Oh. Yeah, so chemically, there's nothing to worry about. It has boron in it, too, I guess. and But the boron is actually a plant nutrient. Right. So it won't harm. And you're going to use such small amounts. I mean, we're talking, I sprinkle a little bit near the, the plant hole, right? It's just a very small amount. Right. So it's it's not going to have any effect on your soil. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Um, uh, yeah, and it's another thing. You know, people have this... Um, I don't know why people do this, but they'll tend to go to a salesperson for advice. What should and a salesperson? And you know, one of my you know, when you're a young person, you tend to get jobs at retail stores. And one of my first jobs as an adult, like as a person, I must have been 19, and this is a point in my life where I had to support myself. Was at a clothing store. I won't say which one, but it was a trendy clothing store in the 90s that doesn't exist anymore. And they saw all these the kind of clothes that. Uh, I don't know, you would have seen on um, uh, popular shows back then, right? These um, weird colors and all this sort of stuff. Purple, silk shirts and all this. Not Bill Bonnet. <laughs> That's the 70s. <laughs> oh, you're younger than that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, in the 90s, like, I remember silk shirts. You would, we, it was really popular to, to go to clubs to wear, like, a blue jeans and a white T-shirt and a black blazer. Or if you were going to wear a shirt, it had to be like a silk shirt with some outrageous color. Um, anyway, they sold all these weird trendy things. They sold fake glasses because it was cool to wear glasses that weren't prescription glasses. Anyway, I had this woman come in once. And I mean, the, the advice they gave me was don't stop selling until the customer stops buying. And whatever they think is good, you tell them it's good. So, <laughs> and you, you didn't make any money unless you made commission, right? I, I, I'm a terrible salesman. It's the only sales job I ever had. 
and I, I have a, a almost a re, um, I, I can't even stand trying someone trying to sell something to me. I can't take it because it's so obviously a bad pitch, right? And I was no good at this. But I remember the only sale, only good sale I ever made. Um, this woman came in and she picked up. We had these stupid looking sweaters that had patches of leather on them. It was really popular back then. Yeah, if you yeah. remember the style. Um, not on the shoulder, not in practical places like on the elbows or the shoulders. I mean, there'd be like, you know, on the chest and weird spots. There'd be pieces of leather sewn on. And then they would shrink at different rates than the fabric when you wash them. They were And they were ridiculous colors. And anyway, um, she picked up one of these horrible, I hated them. I thought they were the worst sweaters I've ever seen. And she said, do you think my son, my son's about your age and about your size. Do you think he'd look at it? Do you think he'd like this? And I said, yeah, Absolutely. And then um, she goes, maybe I should get him too. I said, probably. Um, so she got him too. And then she asked me, do you think you'd like these, uh, the, the fake glasses? I said, oh, yeah. So she bought those. That was the best, best sale I ever made. Those shirts, those sweaters are like $130 each. And that's why you should never listen to a salesman. <laughs> you know, like, especially for gardening. You know, like you go to uh, the great thing about your book. Um, is you're not selling anything. It's not like you're saying this stuff's really good. And if you buy it from me, you'll get 10% off. Like you're just basically giving people advice, giving them your, um, their, your references. You know, if you don't believe me, read this sort of thing. And, and same thing when you go on the, the various uh, blogs you have and so on and so forth. And then you're always pointing people to, um, some sort of article or agricultural extension. And again, when you read that article, they're not selling anything. They're not trying to say, you know, and if you call now, uh, we'll throw in an extra big pen, you know, or whatever. So, <laughs> yeah. I... yeah. No, I'm not. The only thing I sell is the books, not the products. <laughs> <laughs> well, the books, uh, I would say, sell themselves. Um, I have enjoyed reading both your books. I really, uh, you know, like I've, I've sort of, they do, it does elevate your, someone actually at work today was asking me about Blossom and Rock. And, uh, I, you know, I spoke, I sort of gave a little short lecture on the cause and the calcium and availability and all that sort of stuff. So, but, you know, most of that came from your book. Uh, our last topic here is uh, something you get a lot of, uh, a lot of, gets a lot of play in YouTube videos and social media. And I hear, I watch videos of people talking how to make this stuff and talking about how great it is. And, uh, and you can actually buy it. And this is something I wouldn't buy. Um, biochar. What do you have to say about biochar? Well, biochar is one of these new things that I think you're going to see a lot of going forwards. And in theory, it makes a lot of sense. So we all know that we have an environmental problem. We all know we have too much CO2 in the air. Well, actually, a lot of people don't believe that, but a lot of us do. <laughs> we have a lot of CO2, and we... We need to get that carbon back into the soil. That's one of the best places for it. And, and in theory, one of the best ways to do this is we make charcoal or some form of stable carbon. We put it in the soil, and it'll last for hundreds and thousands of years, and it won't come back. And, and so environmentally, this, this just makes so much sense. So people got the idea, well, let's make this, and we're going to call it biochar instead of charcoal. And biochar, I mean, we can raise the price if we call it biochar, right? We can charge more because it's not charcoal. <laughs> um, that's, that's just an environmental joke. Um, <laughs> so the first question I had is, what is biochar? And there are people out there who claim that it has to be made a certain way with a certain temperature and a certain pressure and so on and so on. And... The stuff you make in your backyard in a, in a pit or in a, um, some sort of homemade biochar device just is not going to get hot enough. And so they say, well, that's not biochar. That's just charcoal. The real biochar has to be made under special conditions. So I started researching this, and it turns out there is no definition for biochar. Okay. Nobody agrees on what it is. So looks like charcoal there, and, to me. <laughs> well, it looks like charcoal. Yeah, and yeah. in fact, there are people who say there's really no difference between biochar and charcoal. There's right. this continuum of carbon products. And depending on the temperature and pressure and how you make it, they're all a little different, but they're mostly the same. 
Now, not right. everyone agrees with that, and the people selling biochar will definitely disagree with that because if, if they agreed to that, it means their product's not superior anymore. Um, so the one question is, can you actually make it at home? And um, it sort of depends on how you want to define it. And since there is no definition, uh, you can define it any way you want. <laughs> and so that's, that's my biggest problem with this product. Um, right. Whether it works or not is a different question. But the problem is I can take anything that's black, put it in a bag, and call it biochar. Yes. And you have absolutely no way to know what quality of biochar you're getting. Yes. Okay, so that's number one problem. You're okay. basically buying a bag, it, you don't know what it is. It's a bag of black stuff, yeah. <laughs> bag of black stuff. So the second question is, does it actually work? And right. so we have to define, well, what do we mean by that? Um, I mean, sure, it will be in the ground for a long time because it's stable carbon, so that part works. But is it any good for your garden? Right. Well, biochar is charged so it, it will hold on to nutrients so the idea is that when we fertilize or we put manure or something in our garden the charcoal or biochar will absorb those nutrients and hold on to them until the plant needs them and so that would be a good thing for the plant but there's really very little evidence to show that it actually works in the garden right okay there's not much evidence to show that adding biochar to your garden makes plants grow better. Right, right. Okay, there's theory, and, and we can talk about some science of what might be happening, but the bottom line is when you put the stuff in the soil and you put some plants on top, whether it's there or not, it doesn't seem to make any difference. Okay? <laughs> now, there are, there are re there's research that shows it is working, but then right. we get back to this problem is that research was in a certain type of soil in a certain climate using a certain type of product. Right. And maybe that worked. Right. Then the guy, you know, down the street does a research project and he uses different soil, a different product. It doesn't work. Right. right. So we do have scientific results that say it works and we have lots that say it doesn't. And what that usually means is we don't know enough about the product to know which one works and why. Right. So at this point, I wouldn't recommend gardeners make it. I think the process of making it is not environmentally sound. I mean, you're, you know, you've got to burn stuff, you, you've got gases coming off, you've got smoke coming off, none of that's good for the environment. I've always wondered, like, how, how is this, uh, how is the net effect of this positive? If you, if you make a bonfire to make it, uh, how is this possi possibly a net reduction in CO2 in the air if you're making a bonfire to produce the stuff? Um, well, then we get back to different ways of making it. And if it's made right. properly, what they do is they, they make it in an oxy a low oxygen level container. So right. the, 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 the wood doesn't actually burn. So it doesn't okay. create a lot of smoke. But they're making heat in that container, they, I assume. They do have to heat it, so but they usually use something like gas to oh, heat it as opposed to burning wood. There's no carbon footprint with gas. <laughs> well, there is. And, and so you then have to do the calculation. Is, <laughs> yes. is, the, is the environmental damage you're doing more or less than the benefits you're getting out at the other end? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, and I think for large industrial processes, I, I think it's a sound process. Right. Um, and it probably is good for the environment. But for the backyard person, it probably is not. Yeah, because it's what I would, you know, if I was to make it in my backyard, I would pile up a whole bunch of wood, um, light it on fire, and then like put a bunch of clay or some sort of dome over it to kill off the, to, you know, to, to, to kill off the combustion and just let it sort of bake in there and, and voila, charcoal sort of thing. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't know what the net effect of that would be. I, I always so want, the, go ahead. So, so as far as recommendations go, um, maybe in the future there'll be reasons to use it, but right now there's no reason for a gardener to use it. Right. It'd be handy if they could make it using solar power some, if they had some sort of like glass, massive glass dome that could somehow let the sun energy in and allow the heat to increase so you'd just be using the sun to make it that would be 
Now that would be neutral, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, or some, some to some extent. I, I often wonder one um, one question I have when I'm looking at. Um, I haven't read I haven't read every research project ever done, but often when research is done in, a, in an academic setting, they you use a soil mix, they use a medium, and they'll use the soil medium because it's a controlled environment, right? And say, okay, what what adding this, what effect did that have? But they're not growing the plant in an actual like you know wild environment in a sense, right? With all these different organisms and mycorrhizal fungi and and all these different sort of you know, a mulch or whatever they're that that scientific prod process of removing the extraneous variables, which makes perfect sense to me. Um, the problem with that is that your all of those extraneous variables are going to be part of the equation in a garden. Um, um, well, I always I, wonder, you know, what you know what to take away from studies like that when the environment that's sure, okay, you've shown that in that environment this thing has X effect, but how do I translate that to? Uh, the actual sort of, I would call it like a wild environment of, a, of an untilled garden sort of thing. It's, it's usually a, a two-step process. So when we're trying to understand a new system, it's easier to do it in the lab. Yes. Right? So we use pots, we use ProMix, we, Pro -mix, we control everything, we know how much the water and the soil and it's reproducible. Yes. You know, anyone across country can buy the same bag of ProMix and should get the same Repeat. results. Yep. We, we don't have a lot of fungi and bacteria in there to, to kind of screw up the results and sure. everything's controlled. Yes, right? which is what you want and, for science, for testing a hypothesis. Yeah, and you, yeah. you want to... Because we're trying to understand the underlying science that's taking place. Once you understand that, then at some point you do have to take it out into the field. Field test. Yeah. And this is one of the problems with, with a lot of gardening information is that, that we can point to greenhouse studies. Uh, like we talked about companion planting last time, right? Yeah. There's lots of greenhouse studies about companion planting. But when you take that out in the field, they don't work. <laughs> because right. because the, the greenhouse is too much of a controlled system. Right. But at some point, you do have to take that into the real world, you know, go out to a potato field and see what it does with potatoes, and then go to a corn field and see what it does with corn, and, and so on. And, and it's a two-step process. So both of those sets of experiments are valuable uh, because they teach us different things. Right. As long as it's in the lab, we always have to be careful about interpreting the results. Yes. And we can say, okay, it kind of looks like this might work because we've shown it working in the lab, but we have no idea what it does out here in the field. Yeah. Right. right. In the lab, we, we gave it one insect and we've seen what happens. Out in the field, we, we get like a thousand different insects. Yeah. All are interacting. Right, we can't control the environment out there. We can't control yeah. rain. We can't control a whole bunch of other things. So you can never be sure that what works in the lab is actually going to work out there. Yes, yes. Uh, we have the same problem with uh, human studies, right? We do things in the lab, and we can show a certain drug does A, B, C, and it works really well. But until we take it out there and try it on some rats and then on some humans, we don't actually know it's going to work. That's because right. The human subject and the rat subject is so much more complex than a petri dish in a lab. Yes, yes, yeah. But that petri dish experiment usually teaches us the underlying science and is usually where it starts. So it, it has real value. We just have to learn to interpret what that value is. That's right. And with a petri dish, you can do so many iterations and you can work, work out a lot of things in advance of the, the expense of rat or the... Um, uh, What's it called? Ethical uh, approval. You know, basically, you almost—it's almost impossible to do research with people and get it past an ethics board. Uh, you know, I think this is a problem a lot of people have with um, the scientific research. Is—is is, um, I'm not speaking to myself, but they don't really understand that when a conclusion is reached in a study, it's tentative, right? It's it's tentative and it's contingent on the specific conditions that exist in the lab. And so it's very likely or very possible that at a later date, when, when it, you know, under different conditions, there's interactions that cause a different result. It doesn't mean the scientists were wrong or they don't know what the hell they were doing. It's just 
they had a certain study, they had it set up a certain way, they observed the results they res observed in those conditions. So they didn't say after the end of that result. And now we know for all time that we are right about this thing and it'll always, you'll never hear conditions uh, uh, or a, uh, what would you call that? The conclusion and the results. You'd never see them stated that way. They're actually, if you actually read the technical documents, they're they, they're stated in these very careful sort of ways. Um, so uh, I think it's a, a confusion people have about that sort of thing. Um, it, it is not a. It, it is not a. It, it's a method. Science. Uh, science. People. People think of science like a book of knowledge. It's not a book of knowledge. It's a methodology. It's a way to answer a question where you're least likely to impute your own observation, you know, your own biases into the, it's a way of s solving the problem that humans tend to see what they want to see as, as, you know, and, and even then sometimes it doesn't happen, but, uh, it's, it's a method. It's a method. It's not a book of knowledge. It's a method. It's a method for answering questions and it leaves the door open to change your mind and, and you know, uh, re refine, refine the theory, refine the, the model, whatever it is you're trying to understand. It's science is a long term process. It's uh, very iterative. Yes. And yes. long term, we do get to the right answer. Short term, we can be quite wrong about things. Exactly. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And, and but that's part of the science. It's really at the heart of the scientific method. And yes. you're right. The, the general public does not really appreciate that. Yes. Yeah. Um, they don't have the patience. They don't have the time, and they they want answers. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Oh, Robert, it's been great talking to you once again. Um, everybody listening to this show, uh, if you enjoy this content and you want to help uh, continue to support the show, um, check out the links in the uh, description box if you're listening on YouTube. If you're listening to the podcast on the website, just look at the uh, the show notes. There's uh, uh, coupon codes. If, the, if my sponsors sell something that you like, uh, buy it from them, and that'll help support the show. Um, Robert, thanks for coming on again. I, I love talking about things you shouldn't buy. I'm a natural cheapskate. And uh, uh, whenever someone tells me something I didn't buy was a thing you didn't need, I feel good. Uh, I hope the other people of a like mind enjoyed this. And if you are buying some of these things, uh, we're, we're not trying to uh, make fun of you or anything like that. Uh, but perhaps you'll uh, reconsider uh, where you're putting your money and maybe you'll put it somewhere else. Um, Robert, thanks for coming on. <laughs> Thanks uh, oh, very much for having me. I didn't give you a chance to plug your books or anything. Uh, no, you... <laughs> we talked about the three books. Is there anything else in the works? Well, I have the, the, the Building Natural Ponds and my two garden myth books. And I'm just doing a, a final edit of my new book. What's that one? Which will be out for Christmas called Soil Science for Gardeners. Soil Science for Gardeners. Okay. For Christmas. It should be out before Christmas. And all your books are available on Amazon. Or you can also be found on your, your website. Um, yeah, the, the, well, they're for sale on Amazon. And there is information about the books on my websites. Uh, but I don't sell them directly from the website. It's either. just a link to? I just link them back to Amazon or some other international stores. Right. So if you go to a, most, most major bookstores, you type in Garden Myths or Building Natural Ponds or Robert Pavlis, they're going to see your books. They will. Great. Yep. Right on. Okay. Well, Thank thanks for coming on the show. I loved it. <laughs> Everybody, uh, uh, until next time, thanks for listening. Get out there. Get at it. Have fun in your garden. Thanks Bye, for coming everybody. on. <laughs> thanks a lot.